Very excited to be looking at this passage this morning. Jesus is in magnificent form. So have a Bible open in front of you and let's pray as we begin. Father, as you show us Jesus in your word, open our eyes that we might love him with all that we've got, heart, soul, and mind, and therefore follow him more faithfully. Amen. Now, it seems uh, nearly unbelievable, doesn't it, that it's a year since Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, resulting in appalling destruction and near unfathomable needless loss of life. And as we have done, we must continue to pray for an end to that aggression and a just peace. Now, one of the ways that the terrible impact of that conflict's been brought home to me is by photos like this. Um, Has anyone seen this sort of thing, Um, these before and after shots? Um, There's loads of them online, and it's appalling to see what's happened. We see what once was alongside what now is. Uh, Thanks, Adam. Now, spiritually speaking, there's some of that in this passage when we take it in its wider context. If you remember, last week we were in the parable of the tenants. And God sets up this perfect vineyard. Everything is perfect, and God does all the heavy lifting to make it so. And if you map that part of the parable onto history, it's that he he, he liberates his people from slavery in Egypt, He makes a covenant with them where he gives them precious promises and his perfect law, and then he brings them into the promised land. But as we saw last week, the tenants, those responsible for the spiritual care of God's kingdom, his people, they took what they were given to care for and have responsibility for, and they tried to take it for themselves. Spiritually speaking, that means no matter how the impressive the temple and the worship were, which they were, And now how self-important those tenants felt and how they were looked up to and admired as they strolled around Jerusalem in their robes and whatnot. What had once been beautiful was now in ruins. In fact, the tenants couldn't even get on with one another. The vineyard had actually become subdivided into little kingdoms. Ironically, as the parable shows, the one thing, the one thing that could unite them was rejecting the air. No to Jesus was the one thing they could all agree on. Now what we come to today is a continuance of what we started a few weeks back when Jesus cursed the fig tree and condemns the temple. Now as we've taken our time to work through it, because we're looking at it in detail, it takes about a month or more for us to go through it. It's good to remember that all these events play out over a single week in history. And right here we are in Tuesday of Holy Week if you're trying to place it. And what Jesus is doing, he's carrying on from that table turning uh, and the parable he's told. Uh, And having condemned the temple in his high viz, he's now walking around handing the tenants their eviction notices. That's what goes on in each episode today. And in each one, part of the tenancy agreement, the Old Testament, comes up. And in each case, it's been either misunderstood, misinterpreted, neglected, or just plain ignored. Tenants versus the truth. The truth of what the word meant and the truth incarnate would be one way to describe this. And seeing how Jesus responds on each occasion shouldn't just leave us seeing, oh, I see what went wrong then. Each of the ways Jesus responds opens up for us what life in his vineyard should be like today. So we're going to work through the four encounters and each one will see some distinctive mark of the kingdom that the tenants back then had lost and that we need to go all in on today. So first up, verse 13 to 16, Jesus asks a question about tax of all things, which opens up for us an understanding of our obligations in the vineyard. If we're tenants and the vineyard is his and he's brought us into it, into his kingdom, what obligations are we under? What does God expect from us? And what did he expect from them? Now, the setup, I think, is very straightforward. The the temporal authorities have just fared really badly at the hands of Jesus and been sent scurrying off. Their John the Baptist question didn't have the result they were hoping for, and the parable that followed certainly didn't. And so they go off, and they decide to put someone else up to trying their luck. Can they do better? Because later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to, to catch him in his words. So what you've got there is you've got the Pharisees, 
They're the ones who probably know the most about. They love the law. They love the rules. They're all over that. And the Herodians. Now, very little is known about them, except rather obviously they are pro the dynasty of Herod. Okay? So that means everyone here has a vested interest in getting rid of Jesus, the heir, as per the parable. There's, oftentimes, there's no unity in evil unless it's opposing Jesus. So they come along with a remarkably similar tactic to the previous weeks. They're trying to put Jesus on the horns of a dilemma where he can only come off badly. And here what they're saying is, is whatever answer he gives, he's either going to get arrested by the Romans or his polling numbers, his popularity with the crowd will drop through the floor and he'll be ruined. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Mark doesn't describe it. I would do anything for a picture of the Lord's face as they carried on like that. Is it right? More literally, is it lawful? That's their question. Is it right under God's law, that's what they meant, to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or shouldn't we? And they think, again, they've been really clever here because the question boils down to, Jesus, can you tell us, are you a revolutionary or a collaborator? Because if it's the former, then the Romans will do for him. Encouraging the non-payments of the poll tax was an act of sedition. But if you're a collaborator with the Romans, what kind of messiah are you siding with them? That's game over, numbers through the four, people hate paying this tax, and they'll hate you too if you tell them to. And from a human perspective, I think it's actually quite a good trap. I think many a barrister would be extremely proud to have laid it. Unfortunately for them, they're trying to trap Jesus, and he's the Lord of glory. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. One, you're not going to best me. And two, what on earth road are you walking down where you even try to? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. And the key word, the key word there is image. The coin is stamped with the image of Caesar, so you give it to him. So then, by implication, what are the things of God? If the coin bears the image of Caesar, what bears God's image? And the answer, of course, is we do and they did. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now clearly what Jesus is saying here forms part of the New Testament perspective on our relationship with the civil authorities. Given that this tax could have been used, I don't know what it was spent on, supporting the Roman occupation. Could have been spent on building massive idolatrous temples. All sorts of stuff. It does say something, doesn't it, about what our attitude should be towards the civil authorities. The basic headline of the New Testament is that we go along with as much as we can for the sake of a bigger picture, sharing the gospel in peace. But having peered into that particular rabbit hole, um, we're not going to dive into it because we would get distracted by the implications of what Jesus is really getting to here. Because in saying this, he doesn't mean that Caesar has his area of authority and God has his. You know, people sometimes try and say, oh, you know, our religion, you should just worry about the spiritual stuff, the singing and the praying, and leave, stay out of everything else. No, God reigns supreme over everything, and he's right over everything, and he has owner's rights over everything. But the point here. The point here he is asking is, what are they, the people asking the question, what are they rendering to God? Because as Danny said, it should have been their whole selves because they're made in his image. They bear the image of the creator, so they render their image to him. And here, they're working to oppose his son. They're asking a question about obeying Rome whilst rebelling against God. Do you see that? They're asking a question about obeying Rome whilst continuing to disobey God. 
Now, when we use the word image, we tend to mean something quite shallow. It's surface, it's something for show, it's something we decide to put on for a watching world. The Bible means something far more profound by image. It's much deeper. The image is the core of a whole, all, who all human beings are and without exception are called to be. The people who live in the vineyard are made in the image of its owner, and yet here they've become obsequious, nasty hypocrites with murder in mind. Asking questions like that with the flattery, the false motives, bent on destruction. They are imaging someone, aren't they? And it isn't God. What they were called to be, what they had been made to be, was images of the living God, tenants who look like the owner, which means to render to God, to give to God our whole selves. That's the obligation. God wants a whole lot more from all of us than a denarius or any other financial gift we might make. There's not an inch of us, there is not a moment of our lives which is not due to him because we bear his image. It is stamped on us and that is the most glorious thing. That image is not shallow, it's not surface and it is worth pursuing. So for all of us can ask, where do you and I need to seek his help to look more like him today? Because that's why he made us, that is why you exist, it's why you're, you're sat here this morning. Now, it's a life's work, but it's one by grace we can undertake. See, if we're impatient, if we're not gentle, if we're proud, if our thoughts are frequently taken up with criticizing and scoring others, if we secretly just really love stuff, whatever it is, what do we need to render to God today to be made in his image? No wonder they were amazed at him. Now, that's the Pharisees and the Herodians, the message that in the deepest way, life in the vineyard is about image, the image of God, and the obligations that gives us to live for him. And the next up to be served with their eviction notice, it's the Sadducees. Verses 18 through 27, a question about the resurrection, which Jesus uses to make a very clear point about life in his vineyard. Now, I've discovered this week, very little is actually reliably known about the Pharisees. It's one of those things where people say the Pharisees, sorry, the Sadducees, say the Sadducees thought this, and you find someone repeats that, and then someone repeats that and repeats that. But when you try and find actually the source of this information about them, it turns out it was that someone wrote it once. Very little is known about them. I've been told in the past they only accepted the first five books of the Bible. No evidence for that at all. It's just been repeated, repeated, repeated. They largely disappeared after AD 70, destruction of the temple, uh, because that was their base of power, that much we know. So when it went, so did they. But what we do know about them for sure, and it's relevant for what's here, is what the Bible tells us about them. This is Acts 23, verse 8. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and there are neither angels nor spirits. I don't believe any of that stuff. So they, they step up and they take their turn with Jesus and they're really smug. They tell that convoluted story about this unfortunate woman whose, whose husbands keep dying and she's married seven times. And that happens under the provisions of the law so that she doesn't fall into poverty as a widow with no one to look after. And their question is, at the end of time, who's she going to be married to then? Like the notion of resurrection is ridiculous, isn't it? The idea is because you're going to rise from the dead, the seven men will rise, and they'll all go, I'm married to her, and it would be chaos. Clearly that can't happen. Clearly there's no resurrection. They think it's ridiculous. Now, given that they're talking to Jesus, and we know how Jesus' story ends, even this week, we know they're not going to go on very well with a there's no resurrections are there Jesus line. And as we, uh, as we might expect, Jesus really isn't in the mood for messing around. Jesus replied... Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Ah, oh, yes, you ask this foolish question because you don't know your Bible and you don't know who wrote it. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, again, massive rabbit hole that I'm not diving down this morning. Some people read that and think, phew, I'm not going to be single for all eternity. That's great news. Other people are absolutely gutted and think, how can I be with you but not properly with you for all eternity? The main focus isn't on what our relationships in eternity are like. That's just the entry gate to the point Jesus is making because they started it. Nevertheless, it does speak to the future. Read it very carefully. Jesus does not say we'll become angels. doesn't say that at all. Now, that doesn't happen, and we shouldn't use that language. When young or old die, it is not because Jesus needed another angel in heaven. Not at all. 
but he's saying we will be like the angels in that we won't be married in glory. Because the picture of what marriage points to, Christ and his church, will have been fulfilled. We will live in perfect relationship with him and with each other. The signpost, uh, the signpost of glory won't be needed, the signpost of marriage, because the substance will be with us. The wedding supper of the Lamb will have arrived. Now, if you've got questions about that, I'd love to talk about that, so catch me on the door. But Jesus grounds his assertion here. There is definity of resurrection in one of the most famous bits of the Old Testament, a bit that, that all those asking the question would have known for sure. Look what he says. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Now, in English, it sounds like the point Jesus is making is one to do with tenses, that God is speaking in the present tense. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, and so forth, and that implies an ongoing relationship. That isn't there in the original. It just comes out that way when you translate it. Jesus' point is actually this. What kind of God would God be if he had looked after all those people, all their lives, right up until the point of death, and then abandoned them? What kind of savior would he be if he let the curse of sin and death win? Remember, the people listening would have known all about the fall, known all about how death entered God's good world and how it shattered it. That's why he says in verse 27, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Who on earth do you think God is if he can't save from death, destruction, and despair? That's what he's asking them. What kind of impoverished God are you making out the Father to be if you're stood at the graveside, gents, and all you've got for them is, that's it, it's all over, nothing more? That is a disgrace to believe that. What kind of tin pot God do these men believe in? How dare they, as God's tenants, misrepresent him so badly? That's why he cuts them no quarter. He is the Lord of life, no resurrection. The week they ask that is is, is the week he will rise for his own. Clueless they are. You are badly mistaken. That's an eviction notice served with bells on it on the Sadducees. Next up, verses 28 to 34, he gets a question about the law, which shows us that love is at the heart of life in God's vineyard in his kingdom. Now, this one's a bit different, because unlike the others, it's actually asked as a sincere question. It comes from someone who's been observing what Jesus has done, and actually, he loves it. Look at verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? That might seem like a strange question for us, but it was a a common discussion back then. What were the key ones? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The most important thing, the most important thing in all the world, Jesus says, is to love God with everything you've got. The whole nine yards. Nothing is more important in any human being's life than that. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, you've got to see that. Christianity, the real deal, It's not an invitation to join a religious club that meets on Sundays for a sing-song, a lecture, and some coffee. Christianity, what this inquirer, this man here was looking for, what Jesus invites all those who live in his kingdom to pursue is an every fiber being of your being love for God. Nothing else. See, true Christianity is powered, it is driven by adoration of Jesus. Nothing else will do. Everything else is short change. Love for God comes first. And what fuels that love is seeing who he is and what he's done for us. Now, for me, just seeing Jesus in action these last few weeks, as I've studied him, I love him more 
and I'm just in awe of him. And the commands that Jesus quotes, they were given after the Exodus, the great saving event of the Old Testament, when God has shown his power to save. And for us today, we're on the far side of the cross. And we have every reason, every reason to love God. Strong, hard, moving, joy-filled love. And as we love God, so that love flows out for all he's made. The second, the second great commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now that assumes, it doesn't command that we love ourselves. For most of us, that isn't a problem. But it's saying I shouldn't have myself as number one. And how does that happen? It comes from having God in the right place. He's number one. He's first. It's why love for him comes first. And then out of that love becomes the wellspring for loving others. Which means we don't love the people around us because they're lovely. Many of them are, but some are not. And none of us are all the time. Well, that doesn't matter because our love isn't driven by them being lovely. It's driven by our love for the God that made them and whose image they (coughs) bear. And it's him that gives us the strength to do that. Now, if we settle for less than that, uh, we, we settle for loving people less than ourselves, that won't cut it if we're being remade in the image of the servant king. And if we love God first then we get how to love others right too. Love for God first, flowing from that, loving others. Those are the two great commandments. And we must never settle for that. Like we know what love feels like, don't we? We may have been in love. We may have experienced love from others. Um, And we must never settle for less than that. I think for years I settled for knowing an awful lot about God and thinking with my head he was awesome. I'm not so sure I loved him like I should have done with my heart. This is all in, isn't it? Every fiber of your being, Jesus calls. And why? Not simply as a dry demand from God, but a love that comes from here when we see who he is. The extent to which I am not obsessed with adoration for Jesus and for God is only an indicator of how much I miss them, how much I've yet to understand. But there's more here, because as the questioner responds, he shows there's, there's something going on in his head behind the question. I love this, because he's processing life. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is, the one, is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, and see what he adds, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is so important, don't miss this. They're stood in the temple when this man says this. It's the pride and joy of Jerusalem. The wicked tenants, they're all around him, and the penny has just dropped in this man's heart. He's realized that if your heart isn't in the right place, it doesn't matter if you're stood in the right place. It didn't matter if you were stood in the temple if your heart wasn't in the right place. It doesn't matter if you're here this morning if your heart is wrong with God. You've got to go all in. Shirt off your back and all, and if you haven't, you've missed it. That's what he's realized. And all the religion in the world, all the religion around him, it cannot make up for it. That is an awesome thing for him to have realized in that moment. That's why Jesus responds the way he does. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, he's not over the line, but he's close. And how Jesus responds, I think, means we know this man isn't being smug. Otherwise, he's got it rebuked like everyone else. As I read this, I, was sure, I wasn't really sure about the way it comes across in the English, to be honest. Well done, teacher, he said. I mean, that makes him sound like he's from the home counties, doesn't it? Bravo, Jesus. No. What we've seen is people asking questions, and they use it to big themselves up. That's what everyone here does, and you'll have seen that. You ever been in a Q&A where someone asks a question that seems to be sincere, and when the panelist says something they like, they say, I've thought that for years. Oh, yes. And then they go on about how they agree with them, and they've always thought that. This isn't what's going on here. He's not marking Jesus' homework. He's thinking in real time, and he's saying, this must be right. This must be right. This puts things together. He is engaging from his heart with Jesus which is something we all need to do. It is not enough to understand the words of Jesus. 
Not enough to just listen with your ears. It's not enough to put them in your memory bank or write them down because, you know, in case someone ever asks you something, you wouldn't want to look like a fool. So you need to have all the data stored up so you're ready for answer. No. No. He understood the words. And what Jesus says to him is you now need to understand who's speaking them. He calls him teacher. He needs to know him as saviour. Now, did he ever get over that line? Did he ever understand he was speaking to? Tantalizingly, Mark doesn't tell us. But we all hope so, don't we? I'm going to be on the lookout for this guy in glory. The vineyard, the kingdom of God, is a place where seeing all God is, all that he is, means that we are filled with love for him. It's not enough to believe in God. It's not enough to believe that God is like the Bible says he is. It's not even enough to believe that God is trustworthy. The question is do we adore him? And that's the way it's all supposed to work, a life of adoration for God, spilling out in love to others. Why don't I treat other people as I should? Because I don't love God as I should. As I bear his image, so I will love my fellow image bearers. So it ties up. And finally, having answered all the questions, Jesus asked one of his own. Verse 35 to 37, a question about identity, our Lord in the vineyard. While Jesus was teaching in temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, I'm just going to pause there, that's our doctrine of inspiration right there. David, the man speaking by the Holy Spirit of God, he wrote this. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him Lord, how then can he be his son? Now the point Jesus is making is saying, The so-called experts will tell you that the Messiah is the son of David. They'll tell you that, meaning that he is of human descent from David. He somewhere comes in through the generations, suddenly at some point there's a Messiah. And they 100% believe that, and they 100% believe that the Messiah was human. And Jesus is showing why that doesn't quite work. Because the Old Testament, on which their confidence is based, that a Messiah will come, very clearly shows that he will be more than human. Because how can he just be the natural descent of David when David calls the Messiah his Lord, as he does in that psalm? How could David call someone who who wouldn't be born for hundreds of years after he died his Lord? How could he say that? And further, in their culture, descendants were never considered greater than their ancestors. Sons did not go around saying, I'm better than my dad. Daughters didn't say, I'm greater than my grandma, whatever it was. The younger generations, they looked up to the older, not vice versa. Yet David is clear, the Messiah is his Lord. And they knew that, it was in their Bibles. How do you square that circle then? How do you square that circle where we've got this person who is a descendant of David, and yet is also David's Lord, and greater than him. And what Jesus is saying is, I square that circle. I am the descendant who is greater than my ancestor because I am both the son of David and the son of God. It is the only way to make sense of what you already believe. He's the only one who can make sense of the Old Testament. You read the Old Testament, you'll realize that, that time and time again, there's massive neon day glow signs in prophecy and in the stories, in, 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 in pictures, and even here in the songs of David that points us to who Jesus is. And the tragedy, as you're saying, is the scribes say this and they can't see it. The so-called experts were too blind to see who Jesus is. Uh, the tragedy is, to put it one way, says in their tenancy clause, Jesus was written into every sentence, and they miss it completely. You may know these words from John 5, 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. The identity of Jesus, the identity of the heir from the parable, it stands at the center of everything. That's why we have to make so much of him. It's been said many times before, but it is impossible to make too much of Jesus. can't be done. It is the easiest thing in the world to make too little. 
And because over the centuries, God had said what he was going to do, and then he did it. There's all of this. There's the whole of the Old Testament to get us ready to see Jesus. And God had that written down for us. We do not have to worry that this isn't true or that it's too good to be true. This is, in fact, what we've all always been looking for. And the more we know him, the more we love God, the more we will love others well. And we will find ourselves anchored for this life. So as we finish, we've heard a question about tax. And that shows us the image we bear, the call of God on our lives. We've heard a question about the resurrection. And that shows us that actually life in the vineyard, in God's goodness, it never ends. There's a question about the commandments that underlines that actually we are to be driven. We are to be driven from the heart by the most intense love for God. And none of us must settle for less than that. And there's a question about identity, the identity of Jesus who stands at the center of everything, fulfilling everything, fully man, fully God, the only one who makes sense. But finally, one thing as we close. If you're here... And you don't know who Jesus is, or you're just not sure. It's really good that you're here, and you keep coming and you keep asking. And you need to be clear, because in the end, like our friend here, close isn't enough. See, the scribe, he loved what Jesus said, and he clearly respected him. But Jesus is clear, agreeing with him, calling him teacher, that is not enough. He's close, but he's not there because he needs to call Jesus not only, not only teacher, but savior and Lord. Jesus is God in the flesh and he is worthy of our total adoration. However highly you would say you think of him, however much you would say you respect him, however you would never say anything bad against him, if you are not at that level where he is worthy of all your love, you have not seen who he truly is yet. And the reason that it matters is because at the end of this week, the one we're taking a slow walk through over these weeks, on the end of that week, he gave his life to pay for the fact that we are all rebels. None of us have met our obligations, not one. And he died to pay for that to make us his own. And he rose triumphant on the Sunday of that week to give all of us that forever place in his kingdom. Where are you this morning? And how will you respond? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This morning, don't be badly mistaken. Amen.